oxygen can also exist in another allotropic form other than dioxygen O2. This other allotropic form of oxygen is called ozone and it has the chemical formula O3. So we'd like to be able to construct the valid Lewis dot structure for this compound. Each oxygen atom contributes six valence electrons. Therefore, we need 18 electrons for this molecule. And the only way that we can do this, since oxygen is in the second row, we need to satisfy the octet for each oxygen atom, but we're not permitted to expand the octet beyond eight electrons. To help us in our uh, construction here, we're using two specialized cards. They're set up for oxygen to make two single bonds and one double bond. And if we do that, we see that in the structure of ozone, we can create a valid structure by having one oxygen-oxygen single bond and one oxygen-oxygen double bond. Now, it's very important to point out that students often learn that oxygen makes two bonds. And if you build models of ozone with a molecular model kit, you can be tempted to make ozone in a triangular form where this oxygen atom is connected to this one, this one is connected to this one, and then this one is connected back to here. That is not the valid structure of ozone. That is not how ozone exists. Ozone actually exists as this kind of a structure where we can think of it as one single bond here and a double bond there. But we have to keep in mind that by the theory of resonance, whenever we can draw two different valid structures, one with a single bond here and a double bond there, or with a single bond over here and a double bond over there, that neither one of those structures is the correct structure. The real structure is a sort of average of all the competing resonance structures. As a result, the actual structure of ozone is more like a one and a half bond between these two oxygens and a one and a half bond between these two. So that we see that if we do a crystal structure or any other experimental determination on ozone, we find that both of these oxygen-oxygen bonds have exactly the same length and its bond length and its bond strength is intermediate between a single bond and a double bond. So ozone is a very important example of this type of a structure, especially because ozone is of such importance in environmental chemistry. One of the very most important and serious environmental contaminants is the gas sulfur dioxide, which has the chemical formula SO2. Here we have created the Lewis dot structure for this compound. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Each oxygen has six valence electrons. So altogether we have 18 valence electrons that we have to distribute across three atoms. So using the fact that sulfur is in exactly the same family as oxygen, and we simply replaced the center oxygen atom of ozone by sulfur, we would expect that we could create an analogous structure between sulfur dioxide and ozone. And that's exactly true. We end up having a single bond over here, a double bond over here, and we know that by the theory of resonance that neither of those structures is exactly correct, that the two bonds here essentially average over each other so that both of the sulfur oxygen bonds have the same exact length and they are roughly about a one and a half bond. We see that sulfur dioxide has exactly the same structure as ozone. One thing that might be confusing is that since sulfur belongs to the third row of the periodic table, it has the potential to expand its octet. It turns out in this particular compound, we are able to satisfy the octet. We filled up all the gray regions of the sulfur card, but we don't need to fill up any of the optional ones. Even though we could expand the octet for sulfur, in this particular compound, there's no need to do so. If we react sulfur dioxide with oxygen, 
particularly in the presence of a catalyst, we can create a new gas, sulfur trioxide, SO3. To make the Lewis structure for this compound, we need six valence electrons for the sulfur, six valence electrons for each oxygen atom, which gives us a total of 24 valence electrons. Again, we see another example of a 24 electron system. To accurately uh, satisfy the octet rule for each of the atoms here, again, we need to have a single bond between sulfur and oxygen, a second single bond, and a sulfur-oxygen double bond. In the process, we're able to satisfy the octet rule for all the oxygen atoms, as well as the sulfur atom, while not needing to expand the octet. One last thing to remind ourselves of is that since I could just as well have drawn a double bond between sulfur and this oxygen or this oxygen, there are three different potential resonance structures, none of which is the correct one. The actual correct structure is a sort of average of all three resonance structures. So we end up with something of a one and a third bond between sulfur and oxygen and the other two sulfurs, sulfur and the other two oxygens. So all three of the sulfur oxygen bonds will have the same length. They will be intermediate between a single bond and a double bond. Fluorine can react with sulfur to form several different compounds. One of which is sulfur difluoride, SF2. And here we have the Lewis structure for that particular compound. Each fluorine will contribute seven valence electrons. So with two of those, that provides 14 electrons. Adding in the six electrons from the sulfur atom gives us a total of 20 electrons for the entire system. So we see right away that we can put eight electrons around each fluorine at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and we've used all 20 electrons. And in the process, just having a single bond between sulfur and each of the fluorine atoms, we are able to satisfy the octet rule for all three atoms without needing to expand the octet for the central sulfur atom. In general, whenever we have fluorine in a molecule, fluorine will be on the sides, and sulfur tends to be in the center because it's relatively large, being in the third row, and also being somewhat um, electropositive. Perhaps the most important compound of sulfur and fluorine is the gas sulfur hexafluoride, SF6. This is a compound with lots of electrons. There are six fluorine atoms, so each contributes seven valence electrons. Therefore, that contributes 42 electrons. The sulfur contributes six, so the overall molecule has 48 valence electrons. So we see that we definitely have to satisfy the octet rule for each fluorine. So we see that for the six fluorines, that's going to require a total of 48 electrons. So, um, but we have to combine each fluorine with sulfur by at least a single bond. So as a process, we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons around sulfur. But we realize since sulfur is in the third row, we can expand the octet. So here's an example where sulfur doesn't have eight or even 10, but 12 electrons. And that's what we need because we need at least two electrons to form a single bond between sulfur and any of the six fluorine atoms. One of the features of this particular diagram is that if we use the standard cards, we wouldn't have enough room to uh, put the fluorine atoms in without having them run into each other. So what we did was to fold the card in such a way as to make it somewhat more narrow so that we could demonstrate where all the electrons go and to show that for the, all the fluorine atoms that the octet rule is satisfied, and we show that for sulfur, not only did we satisfy the octet rule, but by adding two electrons here and two electrons there, we've actually expanded the octet. Sulfur hexafluoride is a very interesting gas. It is relatively non-reactive, but it is incredibly dense. You have perhaps seen videos on YouTube where someone will inhale helium gas and then you will begin talking in a very high-pitched voice like a Mickey Mouse. 
What you may also not have seen, though, is if you were to do the same thing with sulfur hexafluoride, you would begin to speak with a very, very low tone. Also, there are interesting videos online where a, two children, actually, uh, make a boat, and they make the, the boat look like it's floating in the air. And the reason why it's able to do that is, inside a fish tank, they filled it up with not ordinary air, but the incredibly dense gas sulfur hexafluoride. So they're able to make this uh, boat out of aluminum foil float seemingly magically in the air, making use of the fact that sulfur hexafluoride is an incredibly dense gas, but it is transparent. So in the video, it looks like there's nothing there. It looks like the video is floating. So this is the Lewis structure for sulfur hexafluoride.